below on Instagram. Thank you dolls so much for your patience. I had a technical difficulty, but now things have resolved themselves and we can go on with our planned live stream and we won't have any interruptions. Hopefully, here's to hoping. I hope you all are doing very well. And for those of you who have been doing the Open Strings October program, I'm wearing my Apocalyptica shirt because you all are rock stars for doing the program and for committing to four weeks. And for those of you who might not know, Open Strings October is a curriculum I designed to encourage people to use open strings as a part of their warm-up routine. So they're five to eight minute warm-ups that you can do playing along with me and they totally involve your open strings. It's an excellent way to work on your tone production and your bow control. So for today, I really would like to focus on Hello, hello to people in the chat. I see you. I'm trying to be formal and do my introduction. But yes, we are here to talk about open string warm ups. And I would love to answer questions any of you might have about the program for those of you who are doing it. Uh, I'm also going to take general cello questions, musical questions. Oh, thank you. Kind words on YouTube. I am glad I am here too. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I love these live streams and I hope you all enjoy them as well. So, uh, yes, today we're going to talk about open string warm-ups. And if any of you have been doing the program and you would like to ask a question about an exercise, about something you noticed with your bow hand, anything like that, your bow arm, again, I will take general cello questions. I would like to give priority to the program, but I will not discourage other questions, of course. So, for those of you who might not know, this program is available on my YouTube channel and will be available after October. So anytime I do a program, I leave it up uh, forever. So you dolls can check that out. Uh, if you're on YouTube, it's a highlighted playlist. If you're on Instagram, you can go to my bio link and check it out. And you can do the program however you like. So, Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm getting some kind words about something fun I will talk about in a little bit. Um, I'm just checking on the, uh, I wanna make sure I don't miss anything on Instagram. Nope, we got everyone on Instagram, awesome. Uh, just don't wanna miss any questions. So I will keep an eye on the chat for open string related questions. And we have a question on YouTube about something else. Very exciting. It says, uh, brava on your Halloween video. How long did it take to film it? It is awesome. Thank you. I wanted it to be awesome. That was my goal. And I just want to check something with YouTube really quick. All right, we're good. Uh, yes, so the This Is Halloween uh, music video. If you haven't seen it yet, please go watch it. It's a huge milestone for me. It was my first uh, professionally produced music video. For those of you who might not know, all the other videos you see on my channel, I have self-produced. And this was the first time I did uh, a professional uh, video where I worked with um, videographers and a video editor. And it was an amazing experience and I am beyond thrilled with the final result. And so someone asked, how long did it take to film it? So we did it in an afternoon and we did about 
there was about 90 minutes for the setup. And during that time I was doing makeup and wardrobe. And then the actual filming process with a little break, we did have about a 30 minute break. So in total, it was about four and a half hours of filming for that music video. And that's just the filming. And then it, I, I'm not quite sure how long it took to edit, but I'm under the impression it was about maybe eight to 10 hours of editing. So it, it's quite, it was quite a lengthy process. Um, for those of you who are curious, the company is Light Forge Studios in Las Vegas. So if you're on the West Coast and you want a studio to work with, they were absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend them and want to use them in the future. And the makeup and custom cello you saw me playing was by cellist David Warner, who's also based in Las Vegas. He's a cellist, a makeup artist, and he has um, done some luthier studying and modifies instruments and will do custom instruments for people. So check them both out. Um, th again, thank you. I've been seeing so many amazing kind words about the video and people seem to really be enjoying it and getting in the spooky spirit. It's my favorite time of year, so it was really fun to do. So yeah, uh, I don't wanna talk too much about the video um, because I, I really want people to go enjoy it um, and I post about it a lot so I'm already advocating for it uh, but it came up in one of the questions so thank you and yes if you have not seen it please go check it out it's on YouTube um, it's highlighted on my YouTube channel on Instagram I've been posting story links and it's in my bio link so many places to go see it all right let's go on to some more questions Let's see. Um, oh, thank you. Someone encouraged a, uh, oh, thank you. Such kind words in the chat. You guys are lovely. Thank you. Um, my buddy Taekwon Cello is in the chat and um, we did a Cello Madness concert series and we have another one coming up. So you'll be hearing more about that soon. Uh, but also, uh, check out Taekwon Cello does teaching, improvisation, really cool stuff. And he's on uh, Instagram right now. So thank you for the kind words, everyone. Um, but yes, Open Strings October. Uh, I will keep an eye on the chats, but I do want to talk about um, some questions I saw on YouTube as the videos were premiering. There are four videos and they challenge you, they get um, not too challenging, but they get progressively a little bit more challenging just so um, you can get more playing stamina and bow control by the end of the four weeks. So some of the questions I had, one of them was about the form of the bow hand, the right hand. And someone had mentioned um, cello doll when I bow, I find my fingers are slipping, slipping off the frog. Um, so that could mean the fingers are slipping forward or they're slipping backwards and you feel like you don't have a lot of control. So that can happen if you don't have enough of the frog in your hand, you know, if you're kind of, uh, barely holding on it can slip or something's off with your balance those again everyone's different but those are some of the common tendencies if we're having bow hand problems excuse me and staying on the frog so what i tell people is when you are doing your bow hand shape right you um loop the uh your thumb in the tip so you don't drop the bow and you have a little more control okay so we do that and you find your bow hand shape now if i gotta make sure you can see this on both instagram and youtube if you're doing it correctly i find again all of our hands are different sizes but generally your uh 
your knuckles are pretty close to the stick. So for me, it's in between my top little knuckle bend and the middle knuckle. So somewhere in between. So if it's right on your middle knuckle or lower, or if you're on the tip, uh, the tips of your fingers, it's not quite right. You have to find the Goldilocks balance, you know, it has to be just right in between your middle and upper knuckle. So when I do my bow hand shape, do I feel that? Do I feel the stick between my top and middle knuckle? I think that would be a great place to start because you want the, you want the frog to be in control of your frog. Wait, I think I just said the same thing twice. You want the frog to be fairly deep in your hand so you have good control over it. You don't want to be too on the tippy top. And if you go too, too far down, well then I'm going to, I'm going to hit my finger, um, on the strings. So really don't be afraid to experiment. Um, something you can do if you want to check your bow hand form and you want to warm up with open strings and try the program, warm up for the program, you know, experiment with open strings. That's something I hope came across in the program is I want you to see all the different things you can do with open strings and ask yourself, well, what else can I do with them? You know, I, I came up with a handful of exercises, some exercises I were taught, some I made up. The sky's the limit in making up your own exercises. So if we're gonna check the bow hand, um, pick a string and do an easy down bow and up bow, and then stop, check your hand, or stop and have a mirror in front of you and check your hand. Did it wander? What happened? Oh, my fingers, my fingers slipped down. So maybe I need to move back a little bit. Let's try that again. And then you think, all right, that looks a little better. So I need to check and move my fingers up. This is the case of your fingers are drooping and you're going beyond the frog. So stop and check, stop and check, stop and check, really be disciplined. Um, one thing that took me a long time to learn when I was younger, and I was a pretty dedicated, um, person who practiced, but I hit this moment in my growth when I realized repetition isn't enough. You have to be very diligent and disciplined and i'm not that doesn't mean you have to be harsh on yourself or hard on yourself you just have to really be self-aware and you have to say did i fix it or why isn't this working i call it uh, being a detective you have to be your own detective in the practice room that's a lot of what practicing is for is for solving problems technical issues so again just really being self-aware because the more self-aware you are, the more you will improve. So it only benefits yourself. You're only benefiting yourself. So that's my pep talk for the day. If you needed it, I hope that helped and encouraged you to want to practice more. I mean, not necessarily more, but to always think, how can I practice better? So yeah, quality, not quantity. All right. So that was a big thing. Um, oh, someone said I needed that. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm so happy um, that that uh, spoke to you in that moment. Okay, so that was something. Um, there were a lot of questions about other stuff with the bow hand shape and just kind of about how, how do I teach the bow hand? So again, it is connected to bow control. I do have a video specifically about the bow hand, but I'll summarize it really quickly uh, because, you know, if you have proper form, you will have more control. And that is what this program is about, is having more bow control. So I'll go through it quickly. Again, I loop my thumb 
so I don't drop the bow. And your thumb is going to go between your middle and ring finger, so you kind of make a fox shadow puppet. And you open the mouth of the fox, and you rest your thumb on this little nub, this little piece of your frog. I'm, I'm gonna do a close up for YouTube, pardon me on Instagram. Uh, let me change my view here. So it's this, uh, let's go this way. It's this little nub that is an extension of your frog. They're usually black in color. And that is what you rest your thumb against. You do not put your thumb on the bottom of the metal. Now, I will say some teachers teach this as a starting point, but eventually you will put your thumb on that little nub. So it's not wrong, but you have to evolve from this. Um, some people use this as a stepping stone. It's a teacher preference. So that's a big thing, making sure the thumb is in the right spot. And so let's go back to our fox shape. We find that little knob and the fingers fall on the, uh, relax on the frog, they flop, and then the ears of the fox flop. And that's your bow hand shape. Okay, that is the bow hand shape. And it will develop, you might, you might, you know, you might have some different finger spacing, um, there's a famous picture on the internet and it's, I think it's nine photos. It's like a three by three of famous cellists, like legendary cellists. And it's a close up of each of their bow hands and they all look a little bit different. And you know, it's, it's unique body anatomy. We all have different bodies. So you might need to, um, you might need to, you know, as you advance and you get more comfortable, you might adjust a little bit. Um, but that's kind of a quick overview on the bow hand. And we have a question on YouTube. How do you practice barred, yeah, barred fingerings and also chords so they integrate smoothly into the playing? Sure. Um, so, yeah, um, I will definitely also do some general cello tip questions today. So what this person means by a barred uh, fingering is, well, first let's talk about a double stop. So a double stop is when you play two strings at once. And a chord is when you do three or more strings at once. Or those are some chords. And um, barred fingering is a double stop with the same finger. So, um, for those of you who know the Elgar cello concerto, the first chord, it's a barred finger. Um, and then actually another one. So you have two double ones. So again, a barred fingering is when you have a double stop held down by one finger. So, couple tips. Um, throughout, when you first start, your teacher will probably talk to you about curving your fingers. There are some tiny exceptions to that rule, and one of them is the barred finger. So, I flatten my finger, and I lay it onto both strings, and here's something important. I weigh it down by kind of, in a, in a small sense, I pull on the neck this way. Just a little bit, you lean into the neck. You don't press down because that's gonna put a lot of fatigue on one finger. So I lean, I don't press and hold it. I kind of lean and in a way, you should always feel that way, like you're leaning into the neck of the instrument this way. Um, you don't need a lot of leaning to have a good contact with the string and have it um, fully down, but you do need to have this, this feeling. So what I do, again, I flatten my finger. 
And usually I gauge the lower note and I flatten and lean. So if I'm comfortable on the A string, but I gotta move down and you, you're gonna have to readjust. So I would start on the lowest note and then lay flat. So find the lower note, get comfortable and then flatten. The other thing is the intonation. When you're, when you're doing a barred finger, you are playing a perfect fifth, which is what your strings are. Your strings are tuned in fifths, and fifths are tricky to tune. So another way I would practice is, first off, um, it can be tricky to know, oh, I landed on it and it's perfectly in tune. Try a couple times. Like really not having it right and adjusting it because you will hear it's out of tune and then when it settles, you'll know, ah, that's the sweet spot. That's when it's in tune. And if you're not sure right away, that's okay. You will learn about it over time. So, Again, intonation, self-awareness, it all ties together and it will get better with time. So so there you go, I, I found the fifth. And then you try to, okay, oh, not quite. again yeah my my B tends to be high a little too sharp uh. there it is okay so working on that and um, and also chords kind of a similar thing and then let's quickly talk about the bow weight so a lot of people think oh Two strings, I really gotta dig in and do double the power. No, it's not exactly a perfect relation like that. Um, two strings, double the weight. It's not quite that uh, black and white. So I think you actually don't need as much as you think. You always want to hear the cello ringing. If it sounds, if you don't, if you don't hear a ring after, you want that ringing sound because you want a beautiful tone, right? And that's the beauty of playing any instrument is loving the sound it makes. So listen for that ring, and if, if, and if it sounds like the string is having trouble speaking, you might have too much weight. And again, are you on a lower string or a higher string? That's the other thing. Lower strings are thicker, and they need more weight. I mean, if you look at them, you can see the C string is the thickest, going to the A is the thinnest. So. An example is the first note of the Haydn and C cello concerto. It's a C major chord. So we have C and G. Those are pretty thick. And then we have E, C on DNA. So if I play the whole chord with a C string weight, Listen, at the end, you'll hear a little, uh, it sounds a little stuffy and a little bit constricted. But if I do a little less weight and I speed up the bow, it's a much brighter, fuller sound. So bow speed and bow weight.
are very important when playing double stops or chords. So the chord is changing, right? We're playing four notes, we're rolling our chord, that's what it's called, that's a roll. And I'm not just going on one setting, I'm changing my bow use because the strings are changing. It's slow and weighted, and then I lighten and I pull. And that allows the chord to ring fully. Now, I know this, I've been playing for tons and tons of years, but you will know with experience how your cello reacts. And But in general, you need a little more weight on the C and G, and a little less on the D and A, due to the thickness of the strings. And if you feel like your sound is a little, uh, 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 like it's not ringing and it sounds kind of strained, lighten up on your bow weight and add more bow speed. Um, this is a, I'll use an open string and theme of this live stream. So, if I heard that, um, sounds a little bit like a sad frog and we want the frog to sing. So I would recommend more speed. So let's try that. Okay, that's pretty good. It sounds a little, it sounds very like insistent, which sometimes you want, but it still sounds a little gruff. So let's lighten the weight just a little bit. Now that's a good ringing sound. Yeah, so experimenting with weight and bow speed. Now, speed with the bow, when we talk about that bow speed, that is not your piece's tempo. That's a different type of speed. So often this gets a little confused. Um, and before I go into that, thank you. Um, the person who asked that question wrote, thank you so much for your explanations. It is very insightful. I try my best. Thank you. I appreciate that. I would love to always be insightful. I try. Um, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we were talking about bow speed is not your piece's tempo speed. We're talking about two different speeds here. Think about speed as bow length. A slow speed will give you a smaller length. A faster speed will give you more bow length, okay? So if I'm playing, um, I don't know, let's just do a scale. Um, I'm gonna pick a tempo. Okay, so if I play it with a really slow bow, it sounds tight. I'm going to keep the same tempo, but increase my bow speed. up. So that's the main difference, okay? When a teacher tells you bow speed, they're not telling you play a faster tempo. They're telling you to use more bow length and the bow has to move faster, therefore bow speed, okay? It is not your tempo speed. It is how you push and pull the bow, okay? So something I would like to talk about that um, oh, before I do, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything on Instagram. Um, the Instagram chat is, uh, it's a little more, it's busier than it is on YouTube, so I never want to miss a question. But it looks like we're good. All right, all right. So something that I wanted to talk about that... I, 
I didn't say it outright in the program. I've said it in a lot of videos, but just kind of an overall, another tip throughout the Open Strings October program is the idea of a pull and a push. When you, oh, thank you. Such kind words on the Instagram chat. You guys are way too kind. Just trying to help y'all and do my best and express the art. Thank you so much. You guys are very kind and supportive and you make the work worth it. You all really do. Um, so a push and a pull. I think is a really great way to direct your bow arm energy, the bow arm energy. Oh dear, wait a minute. Hold on, oh my gosh, wait a minute. Are we gonna make it? Are we gonna make it? Okay, we're fine. <laughs> I forgot to plug in my computer charger. Ah! Oops! But I just got a new battery for my laptop and it is fire. It is amazing. So we have enough juice. I'm sorry. I usually do that, but I'm glad I got that battery. Sorry about that. Okay. The push and the pull. <laughs> um, push and pull. A way to direct your bow arm energy. So let's talk about that for a second. I like to think of a down bow as a pull. Don't do it with the head. I do it for emphasis. And then if a student plays back, they'll do the head thing. So I'm, I'm trying to not get too emphatic when I demonstrate. Don't move your head. It's a pull this way. And if you think about it, that's what we're doing with the bow arm. We are expanding the sound. Kind of like if you're going to do a bow and arrow, how you pull the bow. Um, so let's talk about that for a sec. The bow and arrow. If you are, um, if any of you have ever done archery and you have the bow, um, you have the arrow in the bow and you have to pull it against the string or rope. I don't know the technical terms. That's kind of like what a down bow is. You're drawing your arrow and when you release, when you release an arrow, the, the, the arrow pushes forward as it propels. I literally just came up with this on the spot and I want to use this in the, the lessons I'm going to teach next week. You pull the bow, the arrow in this case, and when you release the arrow, it propels it forward. That's like your up bow. Now you'll never forget. Oh my God, Chelly, I'm so sorry. You're okay though. I'm really sorry, Chelly. It was an accident. You're, you're a strong, strong instrument. You can handle it. You pull. I won't do it again today. I promise. I'll try my best. And you let it push forward. Okay. So when you're doing um, the um, as you're finishing up the program, again, the Open Strings October, your program calendar goes until the end of the month. So you have a few days left. So this is something to kind of think about when you're doing the exercises and you have a down bow, think about it as a pull and then you push. And on often on up bows, we need that push. And that's what week four is all about. Um, for week four, we're playing in the upper half of the bow because that is more difficult to do because our bow arm weight is away from the cello. It's, it's further away, okay? So the weight feels far away and our contact, uh, it can feel like we don't have a lot of control out here. So what I like to do is I lean the arm Sorry, that wasn't good contact, so I'm going to do that again. I lean the arm and I push. And as I push, I talk about this in the program, my elbow and arm all close in. I become relaxed and low again. My issue growing up was when I did this, I often stayed high. My bow arm was too high and I'm keeping all of this weight out of my instrument, which isn't good. So you gotta make sure everything comes back in 
and is low and cozy. Okay, so that is something, you know, if you haven't done the program yet and you want to try it, think about it from day one. Or if you would like, you can, um, if you're continuing the program, if you've already started, you can add that thought. A down bow is a pull and an up bow is a push. And that push, again, is going to give you extra momentum at the tip. And if you have a little duh, that's okay. That's okay to start out with. You can always smooth it out by maybe think of your weight as pushing. Don't think of it as super straight down. It's okay to think about it at first so you can really sink in and you get that kind of sound, but then you lighten up and you combine it with a push forward. So it's not just eh, 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 it's wah, wah. That's how your weight goes. Your weight goes down and over, down and over, and that's gonna push your bow forward. You confused yet? You following along? You getting it? I hope so. <laughs> um, I hope that's clear. I just, in my teaching, I try to use a lot of analogies because some analogies will click for people, other ones won't. And I think as a teacher, um, it's my job to explain things in various ways, depending on the student. Uh, because not everyone thinks the same. The world would be very boring if we all did. So it's important to explain, in my opinion, you should explain things in multiple ways or be prepared to. So if you guys have any questions, I mean, during these live streams, I know they're kind of open-ended, but if I say something and you don't get it, that can be a question, you know? <laughs> um, I love it when people tell me, I don't really get it. Can you repeat that one more time? Or can you explain it differently? I go, sure. You know, it's better for me, um, it's better for me that you all understand, um, kind of, okay, um, that's not very nice. Okay, so, um, my friends, I do these live streams for you, and... Uh, I love interacting with you all, but yeah, just please stay appropriate. Okay. Once in a while, I don't talk about it, but sometimes I see inappropriate things in the comments. It just makes me sad. Don't make cello doll sad because, all right, cool. All right. We are good. So any questions? Any more questions? We're doing good on time. I still have time for a couple things. All right. So, and also it's not very nice to do that because then I get distracted. It's very distracting if you uh, do stuff like that in the comments and it's not fair to the other dolls that wanna learn. All right, sounds good. Okay, so we were talking about the push and the pull and how that can help you direct your weight in the right ways when you're doing a down bow and when you're doing an up bow. So throughout the, um, throughout the program for open strings, something we were talking about with the chords is how each string needs a different type of bow arm weight. That is also very important. So when you're on the C string, it's especially important that you have a low bow arm, you're cozy, and you use a lot of bow arm weight. G string, D string, A string. In that progression, you can lighten up your weight a little bit. Excuse me, because the A string is very thin. It doesn't need a lot of effort to sound. Whereas the C string, you gotta really dig in there. So think about that. Don't treat each string the same because they're built very differently. All four strings are built very differently. 
So think about that. That's very important. And awesome. So um all right. So that's all important to think about throughout the program and <clears throat> the different strings you want to treat them differently you don't want to treat them all the same and again keeping an eye on that elbow that is something i talk about a lot throughout the program it is very important for you to do that because again if you're suspending and your weight is out of the string uh, you're going to get very tired and you're going to have to work harder. Although if you sink low, you're going to be using a lot more natural weight. So here's kind of a visual. I'm going to do it from the side. So it's easier for you all to see if your bow arm is at the right height. I've said this so many times, but it is so important. Your arm is going to form a V shape. Okay. If your elbow is too high, or often students are on level, their elbow and wrist are parallel. You want it to be lower. And then some people will say, yeah, but then I go on to the lower string. Well then adjust with your wrist. So sometimes I see a very flat wrist and a very flat elbow level. So we curve the wrist. That's going to raise the bow stick, the bow. I don't know why I said bow stick. It's all the bow. So you're going to raise the wrist and that's going to give you that little extra height you need to have that low and cozy elbow. So that visual, um, again, is helpful having the elbow on a lower level, a lower plane than your wrist is. And also, you might think, yeah, my elbow can't go any lower. Your shoulder might be hiked up. So that's the next thing I tell students is check on your shoulders. I was very guilty of high shoulders and it's something I always have to think about once in a while. I'll look at some of my videos and I go, that shoulder, man. I sometimes even do it. So don't feel bad. We all have our things our techniques and our technical issues that we will want to work on and always improve. So if you think about that, um, I tell students to do a shrug, but when you shrug, like sometimes if you do a casual shrug, you go, oh no, but really do a shrug where you come up and you just let it go. You just completely let it drop. And then I tell students, this is a little trick, Go by the tailpiece and bring the arm up. Start from the bottom. Have you ever tried that before? You start from the bottom, bring the bow up. If you come from above, that's danger for this to happen. So I shrug my shoulders. I take my bow, my bow hand, I should have said this earlier, your bow hand shape has to be ready. So um, get your bow hand. You do a shrug, you put it by the tailpiece, and you shimmy up on the string. Okay? So that is a great way. Try that once in a while instead of always coming from above to start playing because uh, it, it can, you can accidentally have stuff too high up without realizing it. So. Um, we are, we have a few more minutes left, um, for our live stream. Again, thank you for, um, your patience. I did have to have a, um, I did have to have a delayed start today. So I really appreciate that. Um, it was something technically out of my control and you all, a lot of you are here anyways, and that really means a lot to myself and to Chelly, of course. So thank you for being here. Um, oh, cool question. I just saw this on Instagram. Can you play violin as well? You do not want to hear me play a violin. <laughs> no, I cannot play the violin. Um, 
I mean, have I tried one before? Yes. Um, you know, curiosity to try a different string instrument. Um, but they're very different. I mean, a lot of the language is the same. Like if you go to an orchestra, um, if you're in an orchestra or you get a watch in open rehearsal, you will notice the conductor will use a lot of the same terminology across the string sections. Um, there's a lot of common lingo. There is a lot of parallels between um, string instruments of the traditional Western classical orchestras. There's a lot of parallels, but one of the biggest differences and why I can't just pick up a violin and play it the instruments are complete, the angles are completely different. So a cello is played up and down and I sit like this with a horizontal bow. Horizontal bow, instruments up and down. I don't have one with me, but a violin is kind of the opposite. Um, so if someone were to, uh, it's okay. Uh, if someone were to hold a violin, the violin is horizontal, uh, sorry. Yeah, the violin is horizontal and the bow moves up and down. So the angles are completely different. Um, the, uh, the violin rests on your shoulder and you, you hold it up in a sense with both your shoulder and a little bit of your arm. Again, I'm not a violinist, but I've watched people teach violin and those are, you know, and it's, it's not this heavy thing where you've got to practice being strong and holding it up. A lot of it is about balancing the instrument. Um, and kind of the same thing with cello. I'm not holding it up. I mean, granted, I have my, t um, end pin, which helps, um, but the cello rests against my chest and I hold it like a stand between my legs. So uh, again, the, the angles are just so different. My bow is horizontal, a violinist and viola, their bows are up and down. So the way their weight interacts with the string is so different. It's so different, whereas our bow sits on top of the instrument. Very different, very different experiences. Uh, I saw another question. Oh, someone made a joke. Uh, I can play it, but you may not want to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a common thing. I mean, it's so hard to not be intrigued growing up around so many musical instruments, you know. I have wanted to try so many, so many of them. Um, but, you know, cello's hard enough. <laughs> I think I gotta, I, I understand cello, cello speaks to me. Maybe someday, I mean, I have played other instruments. I did um, take some piano lessons for a while and I did play a brass instrument, which is kind of, a fun secret a lot of people don't know. I played a brass instrument. My dolls, I played euphonium, also known as baritone horn, for quite some time, for a very long time, um, eight or nine years. Fun fact, there's always surprises here on the Cello Doll channel and Instagram. So, I have played other instruments, but cello reigns true. Yes, and I'm not just saying that because Chelly is sitting next to me. I mean it. Okay, so my dolls, any final questions about the program? Again, if you want to try the Open Strings program, um, and or if you are doing it and you did not have a chance to make it to this live stream, Comment below um, on the video, or if you're on Instagram, you can always send me a message. Um, I try to answer cello questions as quickly as I can. Um, yeah, just comment below on this live stream video if you uh, have a question and you weren't able to watch in real time, and I will answer it in the comments for sure. 
And again, try it out. Oh, here's a question. Um, oh yes, okay, this is a great one to end the session, today's live stream. Do you have any tips for people with hyperflexibility in their fingers, keeping their fingers from collapsing while they are pressing the strings down on the fingerboard? Oh, and someone wants to know what program will be next. My next program, oh my gosh, I just got done planning this one. Um, I will end with that, but I want to address this question about the fingers first. Um, I myself do not have hyperflexibility in my fingers. I mean, my fingers are pretty flexible, but that's from cello playing. I know some people with kind of um, things like that, like they can bend and twist their hands in different ways that I can't. And they're fabulous musicians, so don't let it discourage you. Um, so what I would tell you to do is to start off by finding the culprit. Is it a specific finger? It, does it happen on a specific string? Is there any pattern when the fingers collapse? So I would take something easy like a scale and just air play it like this. Or how, however, um, whatever scales you know and however um, high you can go on your scales and try to find a pattern and um, I would also, I do the stop and check method where you say, okay, every two measures of my song or piece, I'm going to look over and check my fingers or at the end of every line. Don't stare at your fingers the whole time because then you're going to start playing like this and this is very unnatural and uncomfortable for your neck. So again, look for a pattern. And if, let's say it's your third finger, my third finger is collapsing, well then, um, so I just, I make up some, oh, you can also do, just try a diff um, some different finger combos and really train that finger. Do it for a few minutes, a few times in your practicing, like maybe once in the beginning, once in the middle, once in the end. Don't, don't do it for like many, many minutes straight. Just kind of do it for a few minutes, shake out your hand, and you might just need to do some reconditioning of that finger or fingers, if it's multiple fingers. And the other thing too is um, imagining that you are holding something round. I've seen people have students hold tennis balls. I've seen people, um, Wendy Law is a fabulous cellist and a cello teacher on social media. She thinks of it as like you're holding a glass of water. So you can, you can use that as a visual. What you could maybe do is, um, if you want to actually use something, use something soft and light. Um, maybe like a clean, squishy sponge. You can kind of practice, you know, put the sponge here and kind of mold your hand around it. Um, if you ever take a prop to your instrument, I can't say enough, it has to be soft, it has to be light, and it can't damage your instrument. Um, so something clean, soft, and light, maybe like a sponge, something. Um, I'm not talking about like a flat one, I'm talking about like those round, tall sponges. Um, don't be afraid to get creative and experiment. Lastly, which program will be next? I am not sure. So what I would like is if you dolls have a suggestion on what type of program you would like to see next, um, maybe I'll do something in early 2023. Um, I'm not sure. We've done a vibrato program. We've done an open strings warm-up program. Maybe we can do something like um, a scales workshop in um, tricks on memorizing your scales. Oh, you're most welcome to the, the person asking about the finger collapsing. 
Um, I hope some of those suggestions help. So maybe we can do something with scales or a rhythm boot camp um, to help you get better with some rhythms. I would be open to some suggestions, maybe a shifting workshop to learn the different cello positions. And when a teacher says, go to fourth position, you don't go, wait a minute. Which, which one is it? So there are a couple things we can do, maybe something next year. I would love to um, keep coming up with more programs for you all. You all seem to really enjoy them. And if they're helpful, that's amazing. All right, my dolls, thank you so much for joining today's Open Strings October live stream. Um, thank you all for the kind words in the chat, both about the program and about the Halloween music video. Please check it out if you haven't. It's doing amazing. I am so thrilled. People seem to really be enjoying it. And we're approaching 2,000 views um, in a little over 24 hours, which is amazing. I have not had a video do that well before. So it's very exciting. And to know that you put something out to share and people are enjoying it. And, you know, that's what makes it worth it. Um, Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's, it's an amazing thing. And I feel very lucky that I can create art and share it with you all. So you're a huge part of it. Thank you. All right, my dolls, more fun things coming in the next few weeks. Keep your eyes peeled. And until then, you know what I say, happy practicing. Bye.